Well, God's Word assumes a spiritual universe. God's Word continually teaches that there are occurrences and occasions and forces at work which are beyond our regular means of perception, our regular vision. To deny the existence or the interference or the interaction of spiritual things in our world is to deny God's Word. Since there are spiritual forces at work in our world, and those forces are either loyal to God or rebellious towards God, we must be on guard about the teaching, the experiences, and the readings that claim to be spiritual that we receive. The teaching that we receive and the experiences that we have can only originate with one of two loyalties. Either the teaching we receive and the experiences we have come from a spirit which is loyal to God or a spirit which is rebellious towards God. Last week I mentioned just how frequently warnings were throughout the New Testament about false teachers, false teachings, and false prophets. I'm just going to give you a brief survey here. This is an answer to question one on your sermon handout. What are some passages in the Bible that discuss false teachers and or false prophets? So here's a short list. If you want the full list, uh, I, I have a fuller list, but it's not even the full list. This is just New Testament instances. If we were to do all the Old Testament instances of false teachers and false preaching, I would need to get out the brown piece of paper that we sometimes hang, and I would need to just roll it all out, all the way down to the four-way stop. All right, that's, that's how often the Old Testament warns and speaks about false teachers. So I'm just going to give you a few of these New Testament highlights. First off, in Matthew 7, 15, Jesus warns about wolves in sheep's clothing. That's so familiar to us, it's in our regular vernacular. It's in our regular conversation. It's a regular reference point. If you want to say to somebody, hey, watch out for somebody, they might not be what they seem, all you have to do is say, hey, wolves come in sheep's clothing. Common phrase that we even use. It's Jesus teaching and warning about false teachers and false teaching and false spiritual experiences. Matthew 24, Jesus warns about false prophets and false messiahs. Mark 13, 22 echoes the same statements of Jesus there in Matthew 24. In Luke 6, Jesus has a rebuke for how well false prophets have been received in the past. In other words, People really like hearing from false prophets, like embracing false religion, and Jesus says, bad. <laughs> Jesus says, this is naughty, this is, this is destructive. Jesus rebukes receiving false teaching well. In Luke 10, Jesus connects his gospel with himself and his messengers with himself. A rejection of his message through his messengers is tantamount, is comparable to rejection of him. So, Jesus teaches here about receiving truth and rejecting either truth or rejecting falsehood. In Acts 13, we're told about a false prophet called Bar-Jesus that Paul ran into during one of his missionary journeys. In Acts 20, verses 28 through 32, there's a warning given to the Ephesian elders about wolves who were on their way, who were surely coming to destroy and sow discard amongst the Ephesian church. In Ephesians 4, Paul later on writes to that church in Ephesus with concern about the false teachers who are influencing, changing, and shaping that church. In Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6, there's a warning about continuing in heresy or apostasy or false teaching as there are some who continue to re-crucify the Lord Jesus again. We do not re-crucify the Lord Jesus. He has been crucified once and for all. In 2 Peter 2, verse 1, there are false prophets who introduce destructive teaching. Destructive teaching. Now, Peter was a blue-collar guy. He used blue-collar language. All right, none of you got that. He swore up and down like a sailor. What else do you want me to say? Okay. All right, that's Peter. All right. Peter, in writing 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, he uses some of the harshest foulest language that we would say was foul and strong to describe false teachers. He said they're destructive. And the term has a lot of weight behind it. It'd be a word that if you just heard it normally in our vernacular, we'd go, whoa, can't believe somebody just said that. That's what Peter attributes to false teaching, false doctrine, false spiritual experiences. He said it's destructive. It's utterly foul. 1 Thessalonians 5 says something very similar to here in 1 John. It says to test 
the spirits. And then, of course, we've got today's passage as well. 2 John, which is another very little book written by the Apostle John. It's only a small book. You can flip over your uh, Bibles if you wanted to, page 864. You can see how small 2 John is. It's 13 verses. 13 verses. Four of those verses, a third of the book, is dedicated to warning about false teachers, false doctrines, and false human religion. So this is a big topic, yes, yeah? so our, our, our ears should open up a little bit, our minds, we need to, when we come into church, we need to not turn off our brains, we need to keep them turned on, we need to pay attention to what we're hearing. God's word warns us that there are false teachers, and we need to keep our thinking caps on, we need to be aware about what we hear about. <coughs> Alright, there's more passages, but I'm not going to get into all more of those passages for sake of time. Uh, question number two. What are the two sorts of spirits that are mentioned in 1 John 4? The hint is to take a look at verse 2, 3, and verse 6. John gives some names to these spirits. In verse 2, he calls one of them a spirit of God. In verse 3, he calls the other spirit a spirit of the Antichrist. He differentiates these spirits in their origin. One comes from God, whereas the other is not from God, it's from the world. You can see that in verse 5. John again names these same two spirits in verse 6, the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. <coughs> Question number 3. What should our default attitude be towards spiritual experiences, messages, and teachings? Here's the hint. Take a look at verse 1 of chapter 4. There are many ways, oftentimes, to interpret different verses in the Bible. I'm not sure how you can get multiple interpretations out of this verse. I really don't know what sort of mental or grammatical gymnastics you can do. This is what he says very plainly in verse 1. Do not believe every spirit. I don't know how you're going to get more than one interpretation from that. <laughs> John speaks very plainly. The default normal position we should have when we hear something, when we read something, when someone tells us something, when we experience something, is to have our thinking caps on and be ready to challenge, mull over, consider, and put to the test what we've heard, what we've read, and what we've experienced. John uses a few verbs here. Uh, some of you were in the church uh, this week and probably heard me listening to Schoolhouse Rock, that great epic song about the verb. John uses some verbs here to describe how we are to set our attitudes about receiving spiritual teaching. The first verb John uses, he says, do not believe every spirit. That's what he says in 4.1. The first verb there, believe. It's the same verb that we are commanded to do in response to Christ Jesus. So, in response to Christ Jesus, we are commanded to believe. We are commanded to put our trust in, to put our hope in, in this life and the next, to swear our allegiance to, to put our loyalty, to wrap all of our hopes, all of our beings, all of our lives, wrap it up in Jesus, to believe in Him. And John uses the same word and says, do not believe every spirit. Don't put your confidence in everything. Don't put your, your hope in everything that you hear or everything that you experience. Don't put your trust in all of these things. Don't swear your allegiance or your fealty or put your loyalty into anything that claims to be spiritual. Do not believe every spirit. Don't do it. The second verb that John uses is to put something to the test. This word here is, is either test or examine. Don't worry, there will not be a test or an examination on your sermon notes today. There, there won't be that. I won't put your sermon notes to an examination. But John uses exam. Carefully consider. Put it to the test. When we receive or experience spiritual things. In other words, our general attitude towards spiritual things ought to actually be to be skeptical. Not to just believe everything we hear, not to believe everything that we read, not to believe even everything that we experience. We are to be skeptical. We're to put our thinking caps on. As God has called us to worship Him with all of our soul, strength, heart, and mind. 
When you walk through those doors, don't turn off your brain. For some of you, this means you need to wake up earlier and come here to the 8 o'clock service. Your brains work better at 8. For some of you, this means you need to stop coming at 8. You need to come at 10, because your brains work better at 10. We need to have our thinking caps on. When we're reading different books, when we're watching different television programs, when we experience something, we need to put it to the test. Okay, what's that test? Well, we'll get to that in just a moment. But an illustration here for you. You can tell it's an illustration because I'm walking away from my notes. <laughs> I once had a really bad hammer. It was awful. The weight on the top of the hammer was terrible. All right, have any, have any of you ever had a bad hammer? You swing it, the weight on the top of it makes it so that way it either goes to the left or the right when you're swinging it. It never hits the target where you actually want it to hit. The handle on this awful handle, or on this awful hammer, was also terrible. It, it was the wrong length, okay? Have you ever used a hammer that was the wrong length? It was long enough, but if you used it with one hand, it was awkward. If you put two hands on it, then it was like, it was too much, you know, and you're breaking the, the head of your nail. It was a bad hammer. <laughs> now, I went to my grandfather's house. He had a good hammer. <laughs> a real good hammer. The handle was just the right proportions. You could hit nails with that thing with one or with two, and it didn't feel awkward or change any of the weight distribution. The head on that hammer was perfectly balanced. It would hit exactly where you wanted to hit every time. It was a thing of beauty. We might even say it was a true hammer. It wasn't a bad hammer like my other hammer. How do you know that a bad hammer is a bad hammer? Well, once I experienced what the good hammer was, I went, I got a terrible hammer. <laughs> I need to get me one of them of my grandfather's hammers. That's a good hammer. Once I had experienced the truth and the goodness of what a good hammer could do, I never wanted to go back to my old junk hammer. If we don't know what a good hammer is, though, a slightly better hammer that was actually still a bad hammer might look good by comparison, though, couldn't it? If I had an awful hammer that had a problem with the head and the handle, then just a slight improvement on the handle, I might think, wow, I really got it made. But even still, in comparison to my grandfather's good hammer, it still wouldn't compare. That's the standard. The good hammer is the way to evaluate and to judge all the other hammers that we might ever use. The same is true here. John gives us this test. We are to evaluate the new things we hear, the spiritual experiences we go through, the teaching that we receive. We are to evaluate it based on the truth of what God's Word has to say. God's Word in this illustration is the good hammer. We need to evaluate what we hear, what we're taught, in comparison to what we already know to be true, which is God's Word. Question number four. What test does John equip the church to use to differentiate between these spirits? Well, it's real simple. John says that a spirit's origin is either from the world or from God. He says the way how to center this test is is to know firmly whether or not the Spirit acknowledges Christ has come in the flesh, that's verse 2 of <coughs> chapter 4, or if the Spirit does not acknowledge Jesus from God in verse 3 of chapter 4. This is the way, this is the test that we might know <coughs> false teaching from true teaching, false spirits from true spirits from God. Question number five is then the next logical follow-up. Okay, so if the test is, what do they have to say and what do they teach regarding <coughs> Jesus? Well, why does John do this? Why does John focus his test around an acknowledgement of Jesus? The reason why John uses this word is because there's a lot of weight to this word. We might hear that word acknowledge and think that it's, it's just a simple thing. But John uses this word in Greek, and it's got a lot of weight behind it. It's the same word used here in chapter 4 as what was used in chapter 2, verse 23, when John wrote, No one who denies the Son has the Father. 
Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. That acknowledgement word. This acknowledgement word goes way beyond just saying, hey, what time is it? Oh, it's about 10.35. That's a simple acknowledgement. This sort of acknowledgement goes deeper than that. It's much weightier than that. The demons who came into contact with Jesus throughout the Gospels, they had a simple acknowledgement of Jesus. In fact, if you read through the Gospel of Mark, it's often the demons who are the ones who are pointing out that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. It's not about a simple acknowledgement. In the demons' acknowledgement of Jesus, that simple one that they gave, they gave to Jesus no loyalty, they put no trust in him, they made no promise of allegiance, they swore no profession of love to him, they desired not to be closer to him, but rather to be as far away from him as possible. John intentionally uses this word for acknowledgement because it's got more weight than just saying, yup, to whatever time it is. This is the weight of professing something under oath in open court and you're willing to go to jail. That's this sort of acknowledgement. This is the sort of acknowledgement that when you sign paperwork on a house and you say, oh yes, all of these bad things and all of these people are going to call me and harass me if I don't make my payments on my house. I'm signing and acknowledging that all this is going to happen. It's that sort of acknowledgement. It's signing on the dotted line. A spirit which acknowledges Jesus is one which is seeking to live a life pleasing to him. It finds its, its very core, its very essence in who Christ Jesus is. A teaching or an experience which seeks to instruct, will instruct, if it is from God, based on Christ's goals for his kingdom. With this test, John has given us a method for evaluating and safeguarding the church and of encouraging one another. True preachers of God's word have no problem with God's people asking questions and experiencing struggles and wrestling with their faith. True preachers point God's people back to God's word so that God's people may know the difference between truth and lies. False preachers love to become dependable middlemen, whereby which you are no longer called to go into God's word, they'll do it for you. True preachers of God's word, even John here, throughout his epistle, is continually encouraging the church that he's writing to, and continually calling them back to the Christ Jesus whom they know. Brothers and sisters, I do not have a different Holy Spirit than you do. You do not need me to dive into the Bible to tell you what it says. I say this with as much love as I can. You don't know what the Bible says because you do not read it. <laughs> Question number six. What are the potential consequences of believing false teachers and false teachings? What's the risk? What's the warning? I mean, why is it such a big deal? Well, first off, you might love the world instead of loving Christ. Those are the first two fill in the blanks there on question six. In chapter two, verse 15, John wrote, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I do not want you to lose the significant weight of this awful outcome that John puts before the church. He says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. This is tantamount to John writing to the churches and saying, you are not a Christian. Don't take it up with me, take it up with John. John's not a brother. <laughs> so, loving the world instead of, instead of loving Christ, that's a big red flag. That's a consequence of believing false teachers, of believing false things. That's a consequence of believing things which are not true. The answer to the next two fill in the blanks is that we will hate like Cain instead of loving like Christ. In verse 11, we chatted about this a few weeks ago during our sermon time, we're told this is the message you've heard from the beginning, we should love one another. Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. Believing false teachers and false teachings and false experiences leads to destruction. 
It leads to a destruction of yourself, and it leads to you being destructive to those around you. Whereas loving Christ means laying down your life for the benefit of yourself and the benefit of those around you. These are some serious consequences. I've heard some people say, well, you know, it really doesn't believe, it really doesn't matter what I believe, because, you know, in the end, it, it really only matters what I do. Brothers and sisters, the reason why we do what we do is precisely because of what we believe. What we believe informs what we do. The test that John gives to us here is no good to us if we do not study God's Word to know what God has said. If I never had swung my grandfather's hammer, I never would have known what a bad hammer I really had. How many more busted nails and bruised up thumbs would I have had? <laughs> now that's just on the micro scale, what a silly illustration. How many more of us want a broken faith and experience lives of destruction and awful darkness when we do not experience God's word, when we do not know the truth, whereby which we can evaluate all of the claims to the truth. The test is no good if we don't use it. Ignorance of God's word is one of the false teacher's greatest tools to deceive and sow evil. False teachers love for people to be soaked in tradition without knowing why something is done. If something is done and there's no answer why we do it, that's probably false religion that we really need to get rid of. If something is done in direct contradiction to Scripture, we really need to get rid of it. False teachers love for people to be ignorant of God's Word, relying more on their own thoughts, their own feelings, their own methods of evaluation rather than God's Word. False teachers love to twist God's Word so that way they can sow frustration and discontentment regarding what God has said. We're safeguarded from all of these harms of false teachers and false teaching when we compare what we hear and experience to what God has said in His Word. All right, question number seven, and then we'll wrap up. How is John's test a benefit for believers? Well, there's probably more answers to this than just two, but I'll give you two here this morning. The first is that believers overcome the world, and second, believers experience victorious living. If we use John's test, we will avoid the pitfalls of falling into false teaching and false religion. We will then also be bolstered by living out our faith in such a way that it is loyal and true to our great God. Rather than being captured by lies, we will be conquering and overcoming by the truth. There is such a thing as false doctrine. There is such a thing as false religion. There is such a thing as human religion. And it's present even among God's faithful people. I want you to follow with me with this thought before you throw any eggs at me. If there was no false doctrine among God's people, why would John have written this to a church? There would be no need to write a corrective instruction, a standard by which truth and lies could be deciphered if there were no lies mixed in with the truth in the church that John was writing to. So I want to encourage us and not take offense at this. We have false religion here in our midst. Don't be shocked by that. What should we do? What should we do about that? We use the test that John gave to us. Oh, and then we close it all down because we found out we've been making mistakes. We got bad policies. We got bad procedures. We got bad doctrines. You know what? COVID couldn't shut us down. Internal drama couldn't shut us down. Staffing issues couldn't shut us down. But now this. This is what should shut us down. We should close it up and pack up shop and all go home. No. That's not what John says at all. He says, use the test. And then remember what John wrote in John chapter 1? In verse 8, he says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. When we find out that there's false religion here, what should we do? Should we close up shop? No. We repent. 
We turn away from what we've learned was false, from what we learned is an idol, from what we've learned is contrary to God's word. We need to search the scriptures and use our critical minds. When we make decisions as a church, whether it's as leadership or as a congregation, we need to make sure that those decisions are lining up with God's ways. We should ask questions of what we do, of what we forbid, and of what we promote. And then we need to see if they line up with God's word. And if they don't line up, then we need to say, Sayonara, see ya, and repent of it. You cannot outsource godliness. You must pick up God's word, examine it, study it, and grow in your knowledge of it. Otherwise, you certainly will fall into false teaching and false religion. Believers overcome the world as they cling close to God. Very practically, on a daily basis, believers overcome sin and temptation as we cling to the truths of God. What does it mean to overcome the world? It means to overcome the ways of the world, the temptations of the world. It means to live knowing that sin is no longer your master, brothers and sisters. Christ is. Believers experience victorious living as we experience growth in Christ's likeness. We who were once drunkards are now filled with the Holy Spirit rather than an intoxicated spirit. We who were once slaves to our physical urges are now called pure. We who were once filled with rage are now patient. We who were once filled with jealousy are now charitable givers. We who were once liars and malicious gossips now use our words to encourage and speak the truth of God. That's what victory looks like. John writes later on in chapter 5, Everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. <coughs> I say this to encourage us. When we find sin in our midst, our response should not be, shut it down and go home. Our response should be, let's repent and turn away from that. Because we have a great God who delights to forgive not just forgiveness one time in salvation, but forgiveness daily as God makes us more and more like Christ Jesus. What grace and mercy he extends to us in daily offering to receive into his arms his repentant people who have recently discovered they've fallen for lies of the world. I'll close today's sermon with another illustration. If you have bad plumbing, what happens? Water everywhere. <laughs> you get a mess, right? Yeah. If you have a bad contractor, what happens? You got a mess. You got a mess. If you have bad religion, what happens? Oh, that's fine. We shouldn't talk about that, Pastor Jacob. <laughs> this is the place to talk about that. This is the place to go, Lord God Almighty, we we made a mistake. Would you forgive us? He is faithful and just to forgive us all of our sins and to purify us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. This is the place for that. If our church is a place where our beliefs and our doctrine is off limits for discussion, I don't want to be here, and I don't think any of you want to be here. This is the place where we are to discuss the things of God and God's Word. So we open up God's Word. And this is how we evaluate our standard of what is from God and what is not. Let's put to use this test that John gives to us in chapter 4 of 1 John. Let's, let's put this test to use. Not so that way we can witch hunt each other, but so that way we ultimately can come to know more of our God and then repent and follow him more and more like Christ. Let's do this together as a church. Let's do this in our families. Let's do this on a daily basis individually. Let's pray.